Dave. My mother calls me David when she's upset with me, and she's 70-some years old, and I still hear it, believe it or not. <laughs> hey, who was here last week? Yeah, not as many came back this week. I kind of thought, I thought I might scare some people away last week. Everybody first service came back. I thought I might lose some folks. You know, we talked last week about who owns our stuff, right? You guys remember that? If you weren't here, we talked about maybe Cain and Abel and, uh, you know, the rich on Euler, and we talked about, you know, kind of who owns our stuff. And we're going to take um, tithes and offerings here in a minute. But um, Ch- you know, who knows Chip Ingram? All right, a lot of people know Chip Ingram. Chip Ingram told a story uh, years ago that really changed, uh, it really impacted my wife and I. And he was uh, young in the ministry, uh, didn't make a lot of money. I think he made nine, ten thousand 10000 a year or something like that. And his wife had to work. He was full-time pastor of a small church. And he had a car that he describes as somewhere between a rust bucket and a good used car. So the way I read that, it wasn't a rust bucket but nor was it a good used car. And that was the only car they had to shuttle wife back and forth to work and do his pastoral duties. And he was praying. Um, His economy improved a little bit, so he ended up buying a brand new car. It's like a $9,000 Kia or something like that, but it was brand new. They were very happy. And um, they had a a missionary come to their church, a guy like Bart. Um, And while the missionary was at the church, the the missionary's car conks out. I mean, done history. It's not repairable. You're out. They shot it. And, uh, you know, crushed it. And uh, so the mystery needed a car, right? So, um, so uh, Chip says that, uh, you know, he's praying about it, and he hears the Lord say, I want you to give him your car. And he had just gotten this second car, and he's like, oh, man, you know, this really, you know, messes with my logistics. I wipe one of my wife to work and all this. And, but all right, you know, it's a nice old car, but it's still probably worth a couple thousand bucks. And what do you think the Lord said to him? Yeah, you guys got it, man. Have you heard this story before? Exactly right. The Lord says, no, I want you to give him the new car, his brand new car. And Chip, you know, I think probably all of us, if Lord, you know, we want to make sure we're hearing pretty clear on that one. I don't think I heard you right, God. And this is what he said. He says, if you own that car, you keep it. But if I own it, I'm giving it away. And it was a, and when I heard that story and Chip's whole message was a really neat, um, um, you know, a um, message on who really, who really owns our stuff. I mean, James says every good gift and every great gift comes from God. Last week, I planted a seed called ownership. This week, I'm going to plant a two-word seed for next week, and it's called um, stupidly generous. Now, we'll see how many people come back next week, but I want to give you some incentive to come back next week. I'm going to be really stupidly vulnerable next week. I'm going to give you some stories. I'm going to actually ask my wife to actually come to church on a Sunday. I'm kidding. I'm just, I'm just, she's not here, right? Now, Rob's going to come in here, and we're going to, I'm going to introduce to you my wife, and we're going to tell you some stories about some of the things that God has brought us through in our 27, now almost 28 years of marriage on this concept of stupid generosity. And um, we have an opportunity also um, to, um, to really serve our assembly uh, and we got a donation card, a commitment card in here. And um, I want to say one thing about this place here. If you guys, does anybody drive by here during the course of the week? Yeah. Man, this place is a hub, man. I mean, I've been a part of a lot of assemblies who, who they're, they're, they're really, you know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, the parking lot's pretty quiet. But on Sunday, everybody comes, and then we'll see you again next Sunday. That's not the way it is here. You know, there, there's a lot of people that serve uh, and spend an awful lot of time doing God's business. And I, I find that personally it's very easy for me to sow into a kingdom, the, an assembly that has a kingdom mindset. And this assembly has a kingdom mindset. And as you know, we had, a, you know, our, our pavement was falling apart, cracks, and we had to have a new pavement uh, put out into the, um, into, the, um, into the driveway, the parking lot out there. And the bill's five grand. And we, you know, our heart is, and I think as you, as you would agree, as we move our economy into God's economy, instead of keeping two sets of books, we'll keep one set of books. And we're running into God's economy. His economy isn't one that we carry a lot of debt. I really don't think it is. And so we have an opportunity in the next 30 some days, 45 days, to raise 50 grand. N- not five grand. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry about that. Hey, uh. Huh. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to listen a little bit more on that. That's an amazing thing that just went this same there. <laughs> That's kind of funny. I asked around. I think we got about 50 families that attend, or 80 families that attend our church. If 50 families gave 100 bucks in the next 45 days, that lot would be paid off. 
And so as, as we think about this week, about the concept of being stupidly generous, and I'll be really stupidly vulnerable next week, I wonder if we can take these commitment cards and pray. Father, you know, what would you have, God? What would your economy in my life, what, what would you have me give into this? And this commitment card, bring it next week, and let's next week pay this thing off, 50 grand. Five, five grand, I can't believe I keep saying that. Um, that's pretty funny. That's what worship does every week. I forget what I'm supposed to say up here. Um, can I pray for you? F fellas, you can um, kind of come up if you want. Um, Father, I just, you know, thank you for this group, God. Father, I thank you that you can know each one, Lord, and you can love each one, that you can call each one, that you can empower each one, you can anoint each one. Father, I just pray right now, Lord, as we give, Father, that you just teach us, God, how to, to, how to mold our economy into your economy. Father, I pray for great return, Lord, on this uncommon return on this offering this morning, Father. Um, Father, I pray favor on everyone in here, all the families represented, all the individuals. I pray favor in return, Father. I, favor, I, I pray increase, Lord God, in their lives, God. Increase in understanding, God, of who you are. Father, we just say a united voice. And, and even if, Lord, um, you're big enough that even if we lie to you a little bit, Father, we, we hear our heart here. We trust you, God. Flesh line up with a spoken word. We trust you, God. Father, we want to be a people that relies and trusts in our Father, and our Abba Father. I just thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And higher than the mountains that I face Stronger than the power Constant in the trial and the change One thing remains alone One thing remains Cause your love never fails and never gives up Never runs out on me your love never fails and never gives up, never runs out on me. Lord. Your love never fails and never gives up, never runs out on me. Oh, your love, your love. And in death, in life, I'm confident and covered by the power of your great love. My debt, my debt is paid. There's nothing that can separate my heart from your great love. In death, in life, in death, in life, I'm confident covered by the power of your great love my debt is paid lord my debt is paid and there's nothing that can separate my heart from your great love oh lord cause your love never fails never gives up it never runs out on me your love never fails and never gives up and never runs out on me lord your love never fails and never gives up it never runs out on me oh your love oh, oh, oh. so how many believe that isn't that like really it when you think about it isn't that life changing when you if you if we actually could get our minds wrapped around the fact that his love never fails that his love never gives up isn't i mean can i ask you something are your circumstances saying something different than that and i believe i believe that Aren't, isn't Vanna and her assistant just doing a marvelous job here this morning? Let's give them a hand. 
We have the best group of people around here, man. I'm just, I'm blessed, and I, uh, I just, I just love you guys, man. I, I, I think about you during the week, and I get excited about our family getting together, you know, once a week just to get together to eat together, more than just pizza, um, but the fact that we get together and just get to see each other, and I was texting a few of my friends last night and just said, hey, you know, let's get together tomorrow. And, um, and, and invite some friends and invite some family members. And, you know, some of you actually took me up on that this weekend. And so <laughs> I'm glad that you're here, and I'm glad you invited some people. You know, how many, how many know that there's a difference between inviting people and bringing people? There's, there's, a, there, there's a relational difference between inviting people and bringing people. And I think that bringing is that fact of that investment part an invite is always nice, and the Lord invites us into things, but how many love when the Lord brings us into something? He grabs us by the hand, and he brings us into something. And I, I want to encourage you that, that what we're going to talk about today, um, I think, has a possibility of changing everything in your life by what you hear today. I, what I don't want you to hear is that what we're going to talk about is about money, because it's not. God, every time he talks about money in scripture, he's not really talking about money. He's always talking about heart. Because he knows that wherever our treasure is, that our heart is going to be. He's not interested in your money, but he is interested in your heart. In fact, that's the only thing he's really interested in, is your heart. Because if he has your heart, if a lover has your heart, the lover has everything about you. And he's the lover of our soul. Yes? So turn in your Bibles, if you would, with me today to, to the book of Mark, chapter 12. Last week, we spoke, talked about the rich young ruler. This week, we're going to talk about the poor old widow. Rich young ruler, poor old widow. And... Can I tell you something? All of us fall in between there somewhere. Me, I'm, I'm, in, the, I'm in the rich young ruler as long as my wife says it's okay. Or Ariel says it's okay, or Levi says it's okay, or Miko says it's okay, or Ziva says it's okay. That's my dog. Um, But all of us have an opportunity, and I want to speak again this week about the word one. Last week, it was about the one thing that would keep you from a relationship with Christ, from entering into that place of discipleship, entering into that place of being in his kingdom. He would speak to the rich young ruler, and he said to him, man, all these things that you have, you say that you've done, you're lacking this one thing. And how many know that there's always a possibility of one thing that is on the table that we're not willing to give up or negotiate. This week, we're going to talk about that one person in your life that God has for you as an assignment that he wants your eyes to be set on. So, Father, I ask today that your wisdom, your revelation, your insight would be released in this house, that we would hear accurately, appropriately, that we would um, know exactly what it is that is your heart, your intentions for us today from your word. I ask that the word would become alive and rich as we discuss these things together this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. In the book of Mark, chapter 12, Father, I pray for the one over here to my right. They got a very bad report this week. But Father, your truth trumps the report right now in Jesus' name. That what the enemy has meant for destruction in this one's life, 
Those very weapons have been turned against the enemy, and the enemy will be defeated by the word of the Lord that's been spoken right now. So whoever that is on this side, take that as your portion this morning and run hard with it. Come into agreement with that word that the Lord is your deliverer. In Jesus' name. In Mark chapter 12, beginning with verse 41. Now Jesus sat opposite the treasury. Can I just say as a pastor, I often sit in this position. <laughs> we can't do that. Jesus sat opposite the treasury. How many of you have had the Lord ask you to do something you have not had the treasury to do it? Just me? Have you ever been, I, 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 I've been finding out, this is good, I think. I've been finding out that when I can do something, I don't need him. But whenever I can't do something, I completely fall at his feet and depend on him. But see, what we so many times, we make our decisions based upon what we have in our hand rather than what is available in our bank account in the resources of heaven. He owns a cattle on a thousand hills. That sounded like the Mr. Anderson from The Matrix. For anybody who has, watches TV. Um, Jesus is the same, would everybody agree with me, yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Actually, forever. Okay, ready? Look what he says. Now Jesus sat opposite the treasury, and he saw how the people put their money into the treasury. They were coming into church. So I just wanted to know, Real quickly, how y'all would feel, y'all is plural for you all, y'all, how you'd all feel if we had our board, our elders, stand and watch as you gave into the offering plate this morning. Some of you would go, I don't care, check me out. See, boom, I got you. You ain't nothing. Then the others would be like, you know what I believe? I believe he watched how everyone gave this morning. That should excite some of you. That should scare some of you. <laughs> Why? Did it say, let me, let me just look here. He didn't watch to see how much you gave. What did he say? He watched to see how you gave. See, I don't think God is interested in how much we give according to this passage that we're going to read right here. But what I think he's very interested in is how we give. I think God isn't interested, again, in how much we give, but I think he's very interested in how much we have to give. Mike Bickle, I mean, so I make this clearer, because I, again, I don't think it's just talking about money. I think it's talking about time, resources, gifts, talents, and money. And all of it is tied to this. What is his expectation? Can I tell you what his expectation is? Well, it's 10%, Pastor Scott, new. It's 100%. He expects... Whatever we have, that it is fully his. Would everybody agree that the reason you're breathing is because he's given you the ability to breathe? The, the reason you're able to go to work is because he gives you the ability to go to work. The reason you wake up in the morning is because he woke you up in the morning. All good things come from the Father of lights, yes? Okay, so it all belongs to him, and he has asked us that whatever we have, whatever he has given to us, that it is all available back to him. Okay, let me break it down a little bit further. Whatever you have of the Lord right now, whatever, if you were blind and now you are C, you now have a testimony. You have to be willing to tell somebody that you were blind and now you see fully. Now, 
as you walk that out more, you're going to get more of God in your growth as you're being processed. So as you grow and as you get more of God, as he gifts you, as he gives you talents, as he gives you abilities, as he gives you insight, as he gives you more passion, as he gives you more life, all of that stuff that's coming, what's required is I give 100% of whatever I have that he's given to me. I make it available all the time. Everything I have belongs to you. Yes? And again, I'm not talking about money. I'm talking about everything. If he has your heart, money's not an issue. Time isn't an issue. Love isn't an issue. Passion isn't an issue. Using your gifts for him, that's no, those aren't issues. And so Jesus is looking and he's watching with everything that he gives to us. He's saying, how are you doing in your returning that which I've given to you back to me by how you treat others? Anybody tracking with me? Does, does Jesus have the ability, okay, does the Father, does God have the ability to see all of humanity saved? Does he have the ability? Absolutely. He's sovereign. He absolutely has, he, but what has he chosen? To use his bride, right, to be his hands and his feet and his mouthpiece into the world, right, to bring salvation to the world. He's going to use everything. But what happened was he gave you all the gifts and all the, everything that you need to accomplish his assignment. If we don't use it, then his assignment will not be accomplished. He's chosen us as a vehicle. I wish he would have chosen cows. He didn't. He chose us. Mm -hmm. He watched how the people put money into the treasury, and many who were rich put in much. Then one poor widow came, silly widow wabbit, and threw in two mites, which make a quadrant. We'll talk about that in a minute. So he called his disciples to himself and said to them, how'd you guys like this? Well, I just uh, saw what somebody gave, and I said, hey guys, come on over here. Look what they gave. That'd be a little embarrassing. That'd be a little uncomfortable. Put on a spot a little bit. But Jesus called the disciples together, and he called them together, and he said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that this poor widow has put, put in more than all of those who have given today. Now, is that true? We know it's not true because she put in two mites, and they put in much. We know it's not true in tangible things, but what's true is in heart, she gave more than the others. Why? How? How'd she do that? Because she gave, right? Or excuse me, they gave out of their abundance. She gave out of her lack or out of her poverty. She gave when it was a real sacrifice. In fact, it's said here that she gave her whole livelihood. The first thing that I want you to know, see, because we're doing this series so that we be really begin to understand the Father's heart. And he gave us Jesus as an example to reveal the Father's heart. So whenever you wonder how God would act in a certain situation, look at Jesus. And when you see how Jesus acts, you know that he is in the explicit image of, explicit image of God, right? Exact image of God. So that you'll never have to wonder how you should act if you want to emulate or simulate or represent God, represent him well as an ambassador, because you'll look at Jesus and say, Jesus did it this way, so I'm going to do it the same way. Jesus wanted to honor his father, so by honoring his father, he did exactly what his father would do, and he would say exactly what his father would say. And if we're going to be Christ-like, then what the result of it is, by us being Christ-like, we're going to model what Christ would do. As a result of that, we're going to model what the father would do. Everybody with staying with me so far? I actually am going somewhere with this. So the first thing that you have to understand about the Father is the same thing that we're gonna, we're gonna pick up out of this passage right here about Jesus. The first thing is this. Jesus or the Father always sees people that go unnoticed. He sees the ones we don't see. He sees people that we don't see. How many of you today understand that there's one in here? Hmm. 
that's struggling with depression, anger, hopelessness, fear, doubt. There's a person or more than one that will be in a room full of people and be completely alone, feeling unnoticed, unwelcomed. See, this widow, when she came into the place, everybody would applaud all of the rich people as they were coming in dressed well, giving. They make sure that they were noticed. We're going to hear about that in a minute. But there's a lot of people that fly underneath the radar that are never seen. I didn't even notice them. I didn't even notice them. I didn't even notice them. And while we were in worship today, the Lord just allowed me to see people that are actually struggling and dealing with a lot of things that could go unnoticed. But the good news is today, can I just tell you this? That God sees you. Church, can I just say this? It's about time that the church, the bride, begins to see the one that no one else sees. Second thing that we learn out of this passage when we read it, is the fact of not only did Jesus see the people that no one else sees, and hence the Father sees people that no one else sees, but the second thing is, is that Jesus sees the actions that no one else sees. How many of you know that what you do in secret is very revealed? If you notice here in that passage, he wasn't interested, he wasn't interested in looking at what the people were giving. He was interested in looking at what they had and how they were giving. What is your intentions? What is your heart? I, I spoke this morning out of Psalm 68, 5. He says that he's very interested, the father is very interested in the widows and the orphans. In James, it tells us that, I think it's James, Yeah, James chapter 1, verse 27. It tells us that pure religion, or in this context, religion is not a bad word. It means service to God. Pure service to God is taking care of widows and orphans and having yourself be unspotted before him. That's pure service to God. Think that the Father takes it seriously that we look out for those that have lost fathers or husbands in their lives. Yes? I was going to say I don't get angry about a lot of things or upset about a lot of things, but I'm speaking in my future that I don't get upset about a lot of things. But I, um, yeah, I'm prophesying over myself. But I, I, um, I got undone just a little while ago. Um, my mother-in-law, um, amazing woman, giving, caring, loving, faithful um, woman, um, for 35 years served very, very well at her place of employment. And um, due to cutbacks and financial reasons and economy and all that kind of stuff, and I get that, I get that kind of stuff, but, you know, she got basically posed with a question, either retire or, you know, we'll encourage you to retire. Hello? Yes, Lord. I will, I'll tell him that. Thanks. Um, and, uh, and, I, and I had to, I had to, I had to um, saddle myself back a little bit um, because this woman who has not had a husband for 30 some years had a language barrier and, 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 you know, and she had a very high profile job. Um, you know, she cleaned toilets, but she did it faithfully. For 35 years 
and to dismiss an honorable woman like that so easily? Something rose up in me. Can I tell you something, church? It's about time, though. (laughs) It's about time that when widows and orphans are neglected or abused, that the church rises up and say enough is enough. See, the greatest plot that the enemy has had is to take fathers out of their lives. And Dale and Katie, I want to say to you, and Bruce, Bruce was here this morning, I don't know if he's here now. There's a number of people that you guys are heroes. I've had 32 living in my house illegally. When I say that, I didn't go through the system to have, you know, fatherless ones living in my house. But you guys fight a system. You guys fight through all kinds of stuff. You, you guys and Bruce and Faith, man, advocates your voices into a culture for the orphans, for the fatherless. And I'm my hero, too. I forgot. I'm my, I'm my hero. The reason we do I matter is because there's a whole generation, 70% of the kids don't have dads. And the ones that do don't have a voice for their children. I'm too busy. I don't have time. Church, I thought my greatest call was the day that the Lord invited me to raise up sons and daughters. And it is. There's no greater identity in the kingdom than sons and daughters. But can I tell you something? He's asking us to grow into fathers and mothers. He's asking us to, see, the the whole purpose of the apostolic nature of a house, of a community, is not the fact that we're going to see, it's not going to be this big circus show. That's not what it's about. An apostolic culture is not just about the signs and the wonders and the miracles. It is about releasing the heart of a father to a generation to say, come back home. You are welcome. You've got a place. You've got a life. You've got a community. I will invest in you. I will pour in you. I will not live unto myself, but everything, God, that I have, I will give to you willingly. So then what do you do, man, when there's so many needs all around you? Jesus said, the needy are always going to be with you. They're always going to be with you. How many know that Jesus walked by an awful lot of sick people? How many know that Jesus walked by an awful lot of needy people? He did. But he never walked by one that the Father asked him to cover. He'd say, Jesus, there's a target. Jesus, there's one I want you to see. Jesus, there's one. And there'd be ones that would press in and touch him. He'd be getting pressed on every side, but the woman with the issue of blood had something that she wanted to draw from heaven, and the Father used Jesus to issue forth his presence through himself into that woman, and she was healed. So I just encourage everyone today, you're not responsible to meet everybody's needs, but you are responsible to meet somebody's needs. There's got to be a one in your life. There's got to be one that you're called to. God gives you a grace to invite people into your home. God gives you a grace to see the one and meet their need. God gives you a grace to impart something when you don't have anything in your pocket that you find 20 bucks somehow to bless that person out of what you don't have. It means so much more when you give when you don't have than when you give when you got all kinds. Oh, I got a little extra here. I'll throw at it. Don't hear that wrong, please. I just want, see, I just want to have a family. I want to, oh, poor Levi. My son, um, all my children, you know. By the grace of God, somehow his heart has been revealed to them. That they know that they're safe, that they know that they're loved, that the intentions of 
my heart towards them is his heart towards them. Even in my failures, even in my mistakes, they were able to see his heart. And I want to tell you something. You can't base your life on your actions. That's the law. The law always deals with actions, but God in his grace always deals with a heart. You can't go back and fix the mistakes that you've done, but you can own those mistakes and you can move on from those mistakes and you can learn from those mistakes and you can power your children by a repentant heart that said, I was wrong. Levi is a very active boy. When he was in kinder, or pre-K, pre-K, he was four, um, his first day at pre-K, um, the head of the pre-K called us and said, we need to talk to you. Oh, boy. Pre-K. I mean, the boy hasn't even started kindergarten yet, and we're called into the principal's office. First day. So Lisa and I go in, and the teacher's in there, head of the pre-K's there, and she said to us, Lisa and I are sitting there, and she says, um, do you realize that Levi is, uh, is very loud? And Lisa and I look at each other, had no idea. Where does he get that from? (laughs) What we've learned over the years is um, what's become more important to us with all of our children, but I guess specifically with Levi and Ariel for us is the fact that we have, um, we've been more concerned about their heart development than about dealing with their actions. And it begins here. Like, see, your actions are a result of your attitude. And your attitude is a result of what's going on in your heart. See, if you, see you can deal with the actions, but that's not going to take care of the attitude or the heart. If you go all the way back and get to the real source of the problem and you deal with the heart, the attitude comes into alignment, which will allow the actions to come into alignment. So with Levi, um, he's moving into Teenagerville now, and he's still loud, and he's still active. Correct? That's pretty bad, right? But what we see in Levi, and anybody who knows Levi, they know he has an amazing heart. Somebody say ba. Oh, fire! Yeah, he has. Yeah, he has that too. So. I, I want to encourage you that, okay, that's with your own children. But as a family, everyone in here, including Mia, is going to make mistakes. We're going to have failures. We're not going to be good enough. But GT, can we start seeing the heart of individuals that the Father has planted in each one of us? And begin to prophesy and call that forth to life. See, the Father saw the actions, and he sees our actions. But all the actions do is reveal what's in the heart, and that's what he's really concerned about. Point number three. So, first of all, he sees people that we don't see. And he sees actions that we don't see. Point number three is, the most important is, is he sees attitudes that we don't see. Sometimes people's actions, you can look at their actions and you can go, well, obviously there's something wrong with them. Have you walked through their day? Have you walked through their life? Have you been in the situation that they have been in? Maybe their attitude has been corrupted by things that have happened to them. And again, see, the thing that's amazing about Jesus is that people never fooled him. They could say one thing and he would actually hear what they were saying. They could do certain things and he actually heard why they were doing it. In fact, while he's hanging on the cross, when he's being murdered, he said, Father, forgive them. They just don't know what they're doing. They don't know what they're doing. And the father's like, wow, that's my boy. (laughs) See, that's an apostolic culture that doesn't discipline based upon actions. We align based upon identity, heart of a person, 
That's not who you are, son. I don't know how many times I had a conversation last night with Levi. I was, buddy, that's just not who you are. Stop stepping outside of your identity. When you act like this, you're being somebody other than who you are. I know who you are. And see, Jesus could look at people that were broken and fallen and destroyed and, and messed up, and he would look at them and he'd say, come follow me because I know your heart, David. I know your heart, Paul. I know your heart, Peter, I know, and I'm going to give you a new identity. I'm going to give you a new name so you can begin to walk in and be processed out in who you are rather than what you were. I don't know about you, but man, we got, oh. I love the fact that when people see me, they see my heart. Not what I've done. Not even what I'll do. Don't, don't, don't look at people based upon the mistakes or the failures they're gonna make. Because we've all fallen short of the glory of God. We've all fallen short of the goodness of God. But now we have the ability to walk in his light. In Mark chapter 12, if we move back up to verse 38, he said this, he said, he talked to his disciples, he said, and he said to them in his teaching, beware of the scribes, those who do the law, those that are religious people, those that uh, have a title. Be careful of people with titles. See, Paul made it and said it brilliantly. He said, I, Paul, am a, a bondservant. A willing, I willingly am a slave of Jesus Christ. Oh, and my assignment is I'm an apostle. What you do is not who you are. See, that Paul was able to, <laughs> how many think Paul's, he's, he's pretty good, right? Paul, he ranks up there. Okay, when he first got his assignment, you know what he said? He said, yeah, I'm an apostle like the rest of you. By the end of his assignment, I'm the least of the apostles, I'm the chief of sinners, and yet he increased in the kingdom. So how do you increase in the kingdom? Go down. If you aren't becoming more teachable, then you're headed in the wrong way. If you're not becoming more humble, then you're headed in the wrong way. If you're not becoming more meek, more gentle, more kind, more not seeking your own way, not self-absorbed, then you're headed in the wrong way. I mean, not self-absorbed, right? Don't be self-absorbed. That's what I'm trying to say. He says, be those who desire to go around in long robes, they love to be greeted in the marketplace. They want the best seats in church. <laughs> I've had people um, email me. Um, Pastor Scott, I need you to fix this situation for me. And I was like, what's that? Uh, somebody sat in my seat this week at church. Right, ready? This is the best part. I said, well, who were, who were they? Well, I don't know. They were new. Great! Let me take care of that for you. This is my, that's the spirit of stupid face. Don't say stupid, Dad. Say Walt Disney. No, Disney World. Say Disney World. That's my Disney World face. Okay, listen. Thank you. Um, let, me, let, me, uh, let me just read you something. Out of 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 2. It's out of the Living Bible. On every Lord's Day, how often? Every Lord's Day, okay. I want to make sure. This, I didn't write this. 
This one, I didn't write this. This is not this. I didn't write this. I'm reading it, but I didn't write it. So, you know, don't shoot me. This is him. On every Lord's Day, each of you, who? Each of you. Should put aside something. Something. Right? From what you have earned during the week. And you should use it for food. For games. For clothing. Oh, what should you use it for? For an offering. Well, how much? The amount depends on how much the Lord has helped you earn. It's in proportion. Does that sound familiar at all? See, his minimum requirement in the kingdom is is that out of 100%, you get to keep 90%, and he gets 10. That's out of 10 pieces of bread, you get nine of them, he gets one. Now, if he showed up at your house for dinner, and you had 10 pieces of bread, and you had eaten nine, and you had given him one, would you ask him for his too? None of us would do that. So we shouldn't. And he says this, don't wait until I get there and then try to collect it all at once. Can I just tell you something? There's a whole lot of people that keep putting off obedience. Can I say this? Delayed obedience is disobedience. Now, here's the deal. Remember the 10 virgins? Five of them were foolish. Five of them were wise. What determined wisdom? Preparedness. Yes? They were prepared, right? And how did they prepare? They made sure that they were watching, waiting, and that their lamps were full of what? Oil. How many know that lamps actually use oil, right? So they, they had to keep replenishing the oil. They had to stay in that place of replenishing. Some of you had have, have had amazing encounters with God, amazing experiences with God. And, uh, you've, you've, you've absorbed a lot of stuff, but all of a sudden, you know, your lamps are going dry. There is an ongoing thing that, that, again, that the Father is looking for, that you refill that which gets displaced. You use it up, you use it up, you got to get more. Pastor Scott, I don't understand, I'm getting dry. I don't understand, I don't, I don't, I don't feel like I'm growing, I don't feel like I'm doing this. Then, then man, I just got to ask you a few things. How are you doing with the oil of the Holy Spirit in replenishing those lamps that have gone dry? Are you being intentional? Are you being purposeful about posturing yourself so that your tank actually can be filled? Because if the lid's closed, I don't care how much the Holy Spirit comes. Can I, can I tell you something? The Holy Spirit is here, and he is reigning big time. My question is, do you have your lid off? Eh, that's not condemnation. I want to see y'all have full tanks. And we're only charging three fifty-five a gallon. Man, we're paying more for gas than we do for a gallon of milk. And you know what his is? Drink. Come to me. All you are weak and heavy laden, man. Just come to me. His rest, his peace, his joy. It's all available in his presence. His presence is the oil of the Spirit, that anointing that just wants to run all over you, and you can walk in a life that is full and rich rather than being depleted. The other thing was when the Lord came back for the the five or for the ten, five of them didn't even notice. They missed him. They weren't ready. They had to go into town and try to make it all up at the end. Can I tell you something? A consistent life of an intentional life, a planned life in his kingdom and for his purposes will produce a secure life. How, does, how do I get my actions straightened out, Pastor Scott? How do I get my attitude straightened out, Pastor Scott? I close with this. Do you know when this happened in a time frame in, in, in history, this, when, when this happened um, right here, this story, you know when this happened? This story happened on the Tuesday before Jesus was crucified on a Friday. Now, I don't know about you, but if you were being crucified that week, this may, may or not have been a big topic to discuss. But for him, it was a major topic to discuss because he wanted 
the hearts of a people to be turned towards him, that there would be nothing that would be held away from him, that they would willingly serve him, they would willingly give. And you know what was really cool? There was this, there was this man by the name of Cornelius. Cornelius in the Bible, he was not saved. Does anybody want God attracted to your life? My wife said yes. Anybody? You want God to notice you? What? Cornelius got noticed by God, and God dispatched the Holy Spirit to go send Peter to Cornelius. Why? Because Cornelius was taking care of widows and orphans. He wasn't saved. Well, what happened as a result? The Holy Spirit sends Peter, a pretty, you know, he's a pretty high-ranked official in the kingdom, sends Peter over to Cornelius' house, and guess what happens? The whole house gets saved. Why? Because he already had something churning in him that attracted God. Can I tell you something, church? The bride ought to be attracting God. Pure service to God is taking care of widows and orphans and having ourselves being unspotted. You can be that. Do you know what was amazing is that this widow, what she gave? She gave her livelihood. Everybody else gave pennies. She gave all that she had. You know how much she made? She made one fortieth of what a normal slave made. A person who would serve, would, 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 a day's wage was a denarial, which was 10 pennies, and she was one-fourth of a penny. She was one-fortieth of a day's wage. That was her livelihood. So when she gave that, guess what? She had nothing to eat that day. God, you can have everything except for 10%. <laughs> really? That's not condemnation, but hear the heart behind the matter. God, you can have everything, period. What is it that's on the table that doesn't, you're not going to let them have? In gifts and talents and time and abilities. I was blind, now I see. Well, tell somebody that you see. I was healed, tell somebody that you're healed. Have... Oh, see, it didn't work. Okay. Um, I guess we better get out of here before it gets really dark. I went to I went to Kenya a few years ago with Dave and Elise and uh Allowed me to see a different culture. I, I was preaching in dumps over there. Let's just turn all the lights off and light our candles real quick. <laughs> um, I was preaching in dumps over there, and um, and if you stayed out too late and it got dark, you could be killed. So we're simulating that here today. Um, <laughs> So, uh, ushers, get your machetes out, please. Um, no, just playing. Listen, but I, I, um, I, uh, I, 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 I preached, and over there, the louder that you are, the more anointed you are, according to how they, like, if you're not, like, loud and distorted, baby, is what they're, right, Scott? Right? I mean, right, Scott and Judy were with me. Nate was with me. Zach was with me. Um, um, Dave and Elise and um, um, J uh, uh, Jay was with, with us. We were... We used to shoot things at all the natives over there. We used to, like, Jay made slingshot. I, know, I shouldn't be telling you guys this, but he made, they would shoot. It was funny. He chased them all over the place. Anyways, um, you, you lived there. You know, did you go? Did you go? You lived there too, huh? Yeah, so same neighborhood, same place. We were preaching at the dumps and stuff, and, and this one, um, there was hundreds of people there, and, and one young boy gave his life to the Lord. He came forward when I was preaching, and, uh, and it was genuine. It was authentic, and then his mom came up and, and stuff. Well, we were there, and, and uh, we're getting ready to leave. We're headed home. And they had a dinner for us. Um, all of the people from the, the community there, they had a dinner for us. And this lady showed up with her three children. And uh, she, 
she brought us a chicken and three eggs. And I said, you know, man, I, I know that they don't have, you know, I know that they don't. And she brought a chicken and three eggs, and, and uh, John Okinda said to me, he goes, you've got to take this. You've got to take it. And I go, man, I can't take, I can't take her chicken. And three, she's got three kids. I can't, I can't take her chicken. She doesn't, she doesn't have a husband. Her parents are dead. I can't take her chicken and three eggs. He goes, you've got to take her chicken and three eggs. So I took the chicken and three eggs. We were heading home, and you know, and like I'm thinking, in 12 hours, man, I'm going to have a cheeseburger. You know, it's like, I don't, it's, you know, and I couldn't wait either because I hadn't had a cheeseburger in two weeks. It's a terrible sacrifice this is that I made. You know, I did take brownies with me though; they were hidden. Um, and uh, and uh, I took the chicken and three eggs. And um, John O'Kidna said to me, he goes, uh, "That was what they had for the month." And she said to me, because you gave my son the greatest gift when you gave him the gift of salvation. I'm just, I'm not, I'm not whining and complaining, but I'm, I'm just making a, a statement of contrast. I have never had in this country, and I've led hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people to the Lord. Never in this country have I ever had anybody give me a month of their wages for the gift of salvation that was given to them. The gospel's free, man. But I just want to say something. It should be the most valuable thing to us. There's something we're missing of value of what has been given. A huge, huge price was paid for this gift. And we can't take it for granted. I think it's enough to live for. I think it's enough to, to say, you know what, maybe, maybe, maybe I can bring somebody else along into this beautiful thing called the kingdom lifestyle that he has for us. Nathan and I end up sponsoring that young boy to get him through, through school. He graduated now. Um, smiles all the time, you know. Um, but my life seriously has never been the same since I saw the generosity of one. Can I tell you something? That in the culture that we live, when they see the church and our generosity, they'll never forget it. I've had people say to me, Pastor Scott, the reason that people don't believe you is because they don't really think that you're, can, how can somebody love that way? I if I'm going to be accused of something, I want it to be that I loved people too much. I've been accused of an awful lot of other stuff that was really true. But I really would like this to be really true. Father, I pray today that hearts would be yours that there not be one that leaves this place, that we're just looking at attitudes or actions because you're a very present future God. And I pray that you align hearts to become yours today. Right now. Jesus, you went to that cross that week to redeem hearts, but you saw in the temple that day that people's hearts were far away from you. I pray that in this house, that hearts would be very close to you. And that's the word I declare over this house, that we have hearts that are close to his heart. That we love appropriately, even our enemies. That, Father, that those that despitefully use us, that we will pray for them, we will engage, we will actually interact in such a way that lives will be changed because they see a genuine generosity, a genuine selflessness, a genuine love, an authentic love that can only be offered by you and authored by you. I pray that we know your heart better and that our hearts would be changed in an instant it can be. And that our attitude and that our actions would display that which has happened in our heart. There'd be so much fruit of repentance. In 
Jesus' name. Stand with me, will you? We're going to worship together, and then I'm going to close in prayer. But I'd like us to worship this one time. And while we're worshiping, we're going to put into action. I'd like you all to find somebody while we're singing this song. This is the one time you're allowed to move around during worship. No. While we're singing this song, find somebody that you don't know. And all I want you to do is bless them. Just go, you can practice right now. I bless you in Jesus' name. That's all you got to do. I bless you in Jesus' name. I, uh, and just maybe introduce yourself, whatever. Just love on them for a minute. But find somebody that you don't know and say, I don't want anybody to leave here today without being recognized by somebody today. Does that make sense? Let's sing this song with Ben. And let's just begin to move and love on each other. Just for three minutes. Take three minutes and do what we talked about today. Come on. Begin to move. Let's begin to move. 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 I'll never let you go. We bless them, Lord. We bless them, Lord. Bless them, Lord. Me go ahead and minister one to another. Love on one another. Clay. Encourage one another. Set my feet upon a rock. Now I know that I love you. I need you. Though my world may fall, I'll never let you go. My Savior, I pray blessing over them, favor over them, love over them. I will worship you until the very end. My Savior, my, Savior, my closest friend. I will worship you until the Go very ahead, man. end. Minister, love on one another. Jesus, you Jesus. are the lover of my soul. Jesus, <laughs> I will never let there, it go. There. Thank you so much. You've taken me from the mire clay. Set my feet, my feet upon the rock. rock. Now, now I know I'm that I love you and I need you. Though my world may fall, you know I'll never I had an let you too. go. I had to go in for they, were, they had to do surgery on my mouth. My I don't think it's recovering now, but I was like, my.